In this podcast, we talk about Borough's Easter weekend, give our prison place picks, look ahead to Swansea and answer your podcast questions. This is the Borough Breakdown podcast and this is all your Borough Match Day chatter in a pod. Support. Curtis Fleming is there on the edge of the air. Fleming for That's Craig it. Hignett. Hit it, Higgy. Higgy hits the track. Oh! Avanelli coming alive again. Janino wants the ball played to him. Avanelli spots out. Welcome back to the Borough Breakdown podcast with Tom, Dana and Matt this week. And we're talking about a positive weekend for Borough with a draw at Southampton on Good Friday and a win against Sheffield Wednesday on Easter Monday, leaving Borough six unbeaten, our best form since September and October, and now mathematically clear of the dreaded relegation zone. So, guys, (laughs) could you give me one word to sum up your feelings after the weekend's games? Dana, I'll start with you. Yeah, I'd probably say content because we're unbeaten in six. We've kept four clean sheets across that run and we're in a really good period in the moment. I'm not going to attach it to any playoff hopes because I think the championship is ever changing and then it could age very quickly if I was to say, oh yeah, but can we, can we do it? Which is probably why we're not discussing it in this episode. But I like the fact that we still have that lingering question because I'd much rather that than Borough's season peter out into nothingness and us be on the beach. So I think it's good that we've got a very unlikely, but still the the slight, slight, slight chance that we could get in there. So I'm pretty content. Form's good. We seem to have patched up our defence a little bit in regards to keeping clean sheets and being more defensively solid. So all is, all is pretty well. I'm not going to go overboard on my feeling. I'm just pretty content at the moment. Just like Borough to uh, give us a little bit of false hope at the end of the season and keep things interesting. <laughs> in this. Yep. Matt, how about you? What is your one word to sum up the feelings after the weekend's games? Um, <clears throat> I'd say it was an egg-cellent weekend. Oh, boo. Egg. Matt, I will be kicking you from the episode now. So. <laughs> you, you can't talk, Tom. That's exactly what you would have said if you weren't hosting this episode. Did you just say exactly? Oh, oh. God's sake. I'm leaving. Bye. Tom Green playbook right there, but um, no, I I I agree with with Dana. I, I I've I'm not getting too excited about playoffs at all. But um, heading into the the final eight games, I wanted two things from Borough. One was for us to absolutely wreck the party of the promotion sides and try and have an external impact on their season and and try and maybe. You know, we've already wrecked our own season. We might as well start wrecking everyone else's. So we did that away at Southampton. Um, I thought we'd draw that game. I just just think Borough are really good in them sort of games. And I thought we did really well in that game to, to get a point from it. And I wanted us to also just show a little bit more of a reassured performance at home. And it should be a lot easier than we make it. But to put aside a, a team down the bottom at home quite comfortably is something we should be doing a lot more that we've not done anywhere near enough this season and I think that's probably what's cost us playoffs if I'm honest them sort of games at home so yeah to see us put aside like Sheffield Wednesday to the sword beat them comfortably could have been more should have been more clean sheet another one to add to Super Senny's list of clean sheets of late as well it's all I can really ask from the team uh, in in recent weeks, and like Dana said, you know we'll see where it takes us. I'm not getting too excited, but I'm glad there is still something that the season's still alive in some form. But everything I'm wanting from the the club and the team at the minute, they're kind of delivering. Um, so an excellent weekend, an excellent Easter. Yeah, I'd have to agree with everything that you guys have said, except for the puns. Uh, I was trying to stay away from the Easter <laughs> puns for for this week, but. Um, no, I, I think, I, like I said, I'd, I'd agree with that. Um, it makes things interesting, in the very least, that we've still got something to play for. I'm not thinking about playoffs or, or getting excited or anything, but, you know, come five o'clock on Saturday, if everyone else around us has lost and we beat Swansea, yeah, may, maybe I'll, uh, you know, get a job in London or something ready for the playoff final. But um... <laughs> I thought you were just going to say get a job then. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> oh, nice. Solid plan. We were talking though, off air before we started though of, of like <laughs> the next fixture of the teams in and around us and Norwich play Ipswich, which I thought was quite interesting, and um oh, the Coventry play Leeds, I think. So yeah, it's good that we're kind of side eye in the playoffs a little bit, but yeah, we'll we'll see as we've kind of touched upon, we'll see where it takes us this this good run. Hopefully we can just continue it. Are you letting Borup get your hopes up, Dana? Don't do it. Absolutely not. Well, I did that this season when I went for bloody second place prediction in my pre-season and egg on my face. Coventry Norwich will lose, not, Hull will lose, face. Norwich will lose, and then we'll lose. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Missed the open goal, yeah. Cool Pete Borough, that would be. Yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Speaking about the run that we're on, though, Good Friday, one all draw at uh, at Southampton. Dana, how do you feel about the performance? You know what? I thought we did well in the end. At, at half time, it was kind of, I thought it was quite humorous that it was very typical of both sides individually. Southampton had a lot of the ball. I think there was a period of about 15 minutes where they had 94% possession. And it was a bit of a tough watch because of that, because Borough just tried to contain them. And then we just didn't have any of the possessions. So it was them really dominating the ball, being patient in their build up. And then Borough conceding a really, really sloppy, preventable goal from our own mistake. So at half time, I guess it was the epitome of two separate teams being fused together in one half of a football match. And I mean, I did also say at half time that it's only a goal. They're only one goal up. And for all of their possession dominance, that is all they've got to show for it. So it was all like the game was always open up um, or open for Borough to kind of still steal something. And you know what? I thought in the second half, our quality improved just that little bit. It was poor in the first half in that I think we did have the openings, but they never really materialised into chances by that Finazar's chance where he, he struck the, the foot of the post because our passing was just really poor. And I think that Lucas Engel was probably the big culprit of that. But it improved just enough in the second half for us to be able to create openings, fashion chances and ultimately get that goal in the end. And it was a really good header from Emmanuel Latilath and a really good pick out from um, Ale Gilbert um, as well but like there was always scope for Borough to attack Southampton they had that really high line given their possession dominance and we had two key players in that game Latte Lath and Jones who've you know they've both got pace although I, again I said this on on the radio afterwards but Jones getting outpaced by Jack Stevens was quite something I do have to give Jack Stevens credit because it was really good defending but I was not expecting him to catch up to Jones in that instance but that was that was a counter attack and I think that we had the potential to probably attack them a little bit more through that avenue but yeah in the end I think we improved just that little bit more and given the fact that they had an absolute shed load of chances and didn't take them that good old cliche of you know will they be left to rue those chances and in the end they were and I looked at the Saints FC hashtag after the game not one Southampton fan was surprised because we just built confidence in that game enough to fashion that chance to snatch the game and um, yeah it was brilliant it was brilliant to see those scenes at the end as well because Borough have a lot of fans down south that you know massively um, deserve credit as well, but especially those that travel from Teesside. That's one hell of a journey, and I'm glad that they got something to celebrate in the end. You mentioned it there about the the amount of chances that Southampton had and and didn't take. With that in mind, do you think we were a bit fortunate to come away with the draw, or do you think Borough deserved it based on particularly the second half performance? I think it's a classic bit of bothery. I mean, yeah. Borough gave up two XG against Southampton, which is our third highest this season behind Blackburn away, which we conceded 2.9 XG, and both Leicester away and Coventry at home, which amounted to 2.1 XG against. I mean, how Shea Adams in particular didn't score, I do not know. That chance in particular where Stuart Armstrong has a shot on the edge of goal I think uh, sorry on the edge of the box I think it is and it deflects off Matt Clark who rushes out to block him and it, it ends up at the feet of Shea Adams about eight yards out and he snatches at it goes wide and then he has the audacity to p- appeal for a corner it literally does not touch anybody I think that's how you know he was a bit embarrassed that he didn't score that one because it was a guilt edge chance but yeah I think 
the more that that happens, I guess, I'd, I'd like to know the psychology behind it, but I do think it probably gives a team that's maybe under the cosh a little bit and has, has kind of rode that wave a little bit more confidence that, you know what, they're missing chances. We could go on and score. We've seen that game so many times. Man United in the Cup, prime example of it. They had chances, didn't take them. We rode our luck and we scored that goal. Um, I probably shouldn't have counted really that goal. The handball rule is ridiculous, but we had it nonetheless. So I think, yeah, it was a bit of both. Borough, to their credit, improved just that little bit in that second half. And as I said, that was enough. I want to put this next question out to you, to you both as kind of like an open floor and it can be a discussion as well. But what were our favourite moments from the game? Because I think personally, uh, something you've just mentioned there, I, I don't know if this was the same instant, but it's it's made me think of it. Matt Clark, slide tackle with his head. It's mm. uh, great, great <laughs> defending and, you know, it, absolute the bravery of him, especially, you know, he's, <laughs> he's come back from a, a, an injury that's kept him out for absolute ages and then he's still putting his head in the way of a potential shot to, to block a goal. I thought that was great defending from Matt Clark. You know what? Lucas Engel's slide tackle there has kind of gone under the radar, but I absolutely love it. He crunches into it and manages to put... Adam Armstrong off, but yeah, that was my favourite. I'm sure it's probably Matt's as well, right? Yeah, it was a, it was obviously an obvious thing to say. Like Lat's header, because um, it was a fantastic header, especially after he'd completely spanned a one v one about ten minutes earlier. Um, it's vintage laugh, but yeah, Matt Clark <laughs> tackling with his big bald head, was <laughs> absolutely fantastic. You just love to see it. And I was thinking this at the game at the weekend. I would not have thought at the start of this season, if you were to tell me that Matt Clark would be our only fit centre-back, I would never have believed you. But um, I think he does deserve a bit of credit. I've seen him in a couple of Team of the Months as well um, online. I can't recall exactly which ones, but he's getting really good recognition for his performances over the last um, last couple of weeks. And I think he's been an absolute man-mountain in, in Borough's centre-back, uh, or back three, back two. And I think, you know, as much as it's good to have centre-backs who can pass the ball out and play it to feet and, and are good technically. I always love to see a centre-back that's just always in the right place at the right time, gets his head on absolutely everything and sometimes just gets rid of the ball when we need to get rid of it. And I think he is that nice mix of someone who's not too bad on the ball, but he's also very no-nonsense and he I'm not getting ahead to the praise and place or anything. But I think <laughs> alongside that diving headed tackle, he does deserve immense credit for his, um, his performances of late. They've been brilliant. I think he deserves it in general because, you know, he came back into the team. He was thrown back into the mix, wasn't he, against Leeds because Paddy McNair picked up an injury. And for him to have been out for as long as he was with that back injury that was obviously incredibly troublesome for him, hence the amount of time that he was out on the sidelines. You know, he's been really good considering that. And I like Clark. And the point that you made there, Matt, about being good on the ball a lot of Borough fans seem to have nervousness when he is on it and I think I said last week that he you know he, he turns really slowly like a fucking a reaver but at the same time like I actually think he's pretty good on the ball and he's had a reputation he's garnered a reputation over the years of being a good defender in possession so yeah props to Matt Clark real real credit to him because I can't imagine that being thrown back into the mix after such a lengthy injury would have been an easy process for him I just want to go back to um, a moment you mentioned right at the start there, Matt, uh, Latte Laugh's header. For me, as soon as that went in, other than you know the absolute joy of, of celebrating the equaliser, that actually brought back some memories for me, and I don't know if it's the same for you guys. David Nugent's header against Hull in the, mm. uh, in the promotion <clears throat> season. What a moment. I, I thought it was a very, very similar sort of header. Uh, obviously, I think it was the same corner of the goal as well, but the the control that he got on that header and the the technique to to guide that into out of the reach of the keeper and into the bottom corner, I, I just thought it, it was such a good header from uh, from Lath. Yeah, I want to make a point about Lath as well. I I thought this after the the Southampton game. I think it was. I think he is a striker that works on instinct. He has to do things instinctively. I've noticed when he's running in behind 1v1 and he's got time to pick a spot, I have no faith that he's... <laughs> well, no, not no yeah. faith, but not as much faith as I probably should that he's going to pick a corner and, and bury it. But we saw the snapshot volley against QPR. That come out of nowhere. He just latched onto it, put it in the bottom corner. 
you know, a really quick header. I think he's a striker who works on instinct. I love that chaotic side to him, but I think if he can refine his composure in front of goal, I think his, his some of his finishes this season just on instinct have been fantastic. So that's certainly a positive, I think, from him from a striking and finishing point of view. He just needs a bit more composure. Well, I want to talk about that, Elif, and the, the next question, because I've got a, a stat here. He's, you know... 46 games, his goals per match is good enough to score 22 goals this season over 46 games. Can we go into next season with confidence in him to be our main striker? Um, you know, obviously, he, he's spent a lot of the season out injured. He's not been able to play the full 46, but if he did next season, do you guys think he could be relied upon as our main striker next season? I think so. I, I quite like the attributes that he does have because he's, I wouldn't say he's well-rounded because he's not yet refined. There's quite a lot of, like he's, he is or can be quite erratic, but I do like that he's got many different strings to his bow that he's got one hell of a leap on him. For someone that is on the short side of a striker, of a centre forward, like he's, like he, he can jump and he's very agile and We've seen him quite a few times this season out muscle a centre half. I think it might have been Kipre against West Brom that I remember in particular where he absolutely floored him. And Kipre is quite a big built centre half as well. And Matt said it on the last pod that he, he did it against Blackburn, was it? So he, you know, he's he's decently strong as well and he's quick and he does fashion chances for himself because of the movement that he has so I quite like the attributes that he does have and the guy in front of me at the match yesterday was saying I, I want to see what he would be like with a full season under his belt and I completely agree I think that although he does miss chances like the one-on-ones that Matt alluded to I still think that he gets enough to probably score quite a few and as you said there the stat kind of backs it up so yeah, I think we can rely on him next season. I still would like to see another striker come in just for depth purposes, depth and quality purposes. But I do think that we can rely on Latte Lath. And he's probably one to look out for from like a championship neutral that might be listening to this podcast. And any gaffer players, managers, um, he's probably one to look out for. Yeah, I totally agree. Matt, what do you think? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to see him alongside... I think he'd play well off of another striker, especially. Um, I liked him alongside Marcus Force. I'd be more than happy to see that across mm -hmm. a, a season. But I don't know if I have faith in Force to stay for either. I think we'd have to get quite fortunate to see both of them play the majority of the season. I think, in my opinion, hasn't changed on, on, on the striking front. I definitely, like Dana, would, would rather have another striker in there for depth because we've we've seen this season um, without Lath and Force. And maybe Coburn at times, you know, we, we've looked quite light with the likes of Stick and Silvera and Greenwood up front. So I think just for that added reassurance of of the goals we need, absolutely. But I wouldn't be against him being the starter. And I don't think I would have said that a few months ago. So that's credit to, to his great form and what he's been able to do when he's been fit. I think it has really started to click for him towards the end of the season. Um, and... I'm, I'm loving seeing this because that that is just reminding me that I've said from uh, you know months ago that we were going to click as a team around yeah, now and finish on <laughs> seventh. So if we finish seventh, I'm putting the lottery on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but Matt, I've got the the next question for you. Um, obviously, an injury to Isaiah Jones gave a chance to Alex Gilbert in the uh, Southampton game. Sixty-seven minutes of Championship football this season. Uh, he picks up an assist against Southampton. Why do you think he's not that, had that many minutes in a Borough shirt, even with the injuries we've had uh, so far this season? I can only, I can only think that Carrick's not quite fancied him. And I mean, to have the the number of injuries we've had in for him to still not have a run in the team, I can only put it down to that. But I think we're at a point in the season now where I'd love to be seeing a lot more from Alex Gilbert. Um, in terms of how many minutes he's getting because I still think he's a bit of an unknown. I, I still think we, we're not too sure how good he actually is. He's not had that run in the side yet. I mean, the ball he put in for Lath was, was brilliant. So I'd love to see him in the side. And I've kind of got this, I don't know, I just think with, with seven games to go now, or is it six? I think 
with the lone players like let's 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 assume that we're probably not going to get playoffs and you know we've we've got six games or whatever to develop some of our own give a couple of players a chance i would much rather see alex gilbert given a chance in the team over a sam greenwood who i still think's pretty ineffective across the hall he's not going to be here next season i dare say he's not our player so i think when you're looking at some of the players in the team, when there are injuries, I'd much rather see Gilbert be given a chance than than Greenwood, for example, in the team at this stage of the season. I can only assume he's Carrick's not liked what he's seen or, or doesn't quite think he's ready, but I think we're at a point in the season where you may as well chuck him in and see what he can do. He, as I say, fantastic assist against Southampton. So I definitely think there's quality there. We just haven't had a chance to see it. It's a fair point. Uh, on, the, on the subject of injuries, Riley McGree and Marcus Force both Confirmed out for the season. Say out for the season sounds a bit dramatic for six games, <laughs> but uh, it does mean the poor ha- now have a full eleven out injured once again. Um, you look over the course of the season as well. Um, who hasn't been injured? We've tried to narrow it down in our group chat, and we think we have. Other than the uh, January and lo- uh, January Lonies and Finazaz, we think it's only Jamie Jones and Dan Barlasser who haven't haven't been injured this season. So if we've got that wrong, if there's anyone else we've missed there, obviously p- feel free to comment in our our video or tweet us or whatever and uh, correct us there. But it does seem it's... you know every other person in the team's been injured. It's also um, the Asia Cup suspensions and being ineligible to face their parent club so it's kind of there's just been an absolute cluster of unavailability this season for multiple reasons but yeah unless jamie jones maybe jamie jones has got an injury we just don't know do we because obviously third (laughs) choice goalkeeper he could easily have been injured at some point this season we just don't know about it so i I guess if we we put a question mark over jamie jones dan barlasser is the only one that hasn't been unavailable this season, which is absolutely outstanding. It's astonishing that that's, that's been the case. I have to start calling him Iron Man Dan Barlasser. But, <laughs> <laughs> Matt, do you think the injury slash unavailability, unavailability problem that we've had has kind of derailed our season? Uh, not even kind of, maybe completely derailed our season. Yeah, it's... I've never ever known anything like it. I, I know it's a more common theme in football that teams are getting a lot more in- injuries for whatever reason, but I've never seen anything like it at Borough. And I, I kind of feel for Michael Carrick in a sense. And I think it maybe takes away some credit to the job he's actually done to have us in the position we're in. At times, he's been, you know, juggling literally his first 11 being out. I remember, I think, the Coventry game, and we had 14 senior players out that day on the bench. We literally had. Like Dyke Steele, Silvera, and maybe a goalkeeper as our only senior substitutes, which was just crazy. So it is, I guess, a bit of an annoying what if of you know what what maybe could have been this season had we not had the injuries. I would love to know whether it was just down to bad luck. Part of me thinks we surely can do some improvements from a training, recovery, conditioning point of view. I'd like to think there's something we can do to improve it. If not, then we must have smashed a thousand mirrors or something or walked under a gazillion ladders this season because it's just absolutely ridiculous. So it excites me in a weird sense to see what this Borough side would do fully fit across the season. And I do feel like we would have been well in the playoff mix had we had a full strength squad. But saying that, I do remember just before Christmas when we were absolutely embroiled with loads of injuries, we actually played quite well. We played respectively quite well in that period. And it was when we started getting players back, ironically, in January, we actually we absolutely went down the, uh, the shitter in our form. So I don't know. I don't know. But um, yeah, it's, it's certainly had an effect on the season. It, it, it's a real shame that um, we've not been able to see the full potential of this, this squad. Well, I'm going to ask this question to you both as kind of a, a, another open floor question. But And people may say things that they're going to regret <laughs> later. This isn't going to be like a pre-season predictions again hopefully but if Borough had a fully fit squad uh, throughout the entire season where do you think it ranks compared to the rest of the championship and where do you think where would you expect the fully fit Borough team to be in the league at this point? I reckon about sixth my mind was teetering between sixth and seventh but when I think of the chasing playoff pack and Norwich like there's not a big 
gap in terms of quality there isn't a huge difference there like it's not as if Norwich are significantly better in sixth place than whoever is in is it Coventry in seventh I think than they are in seventh so I think sixth or seventh but I'm gonna say sixth and I think Emmanuel Latte-Lath is a big player in that because as we've discussed trending on 22 goals this season if he was to be available for the majority of it averaging a goal every two games like that is really good and I know that Borough don't necessarily have the depth up front but you know in this hypothetical situation if everybody was fit and stay fit which would be a, a dream rather delusional one mind but a dream then I think he would be a big big part of that because ultimately Borough are or have been a creative side and we've just kind of needed that player to kind of finish those chances off and like don't get me wrong Latte Lath I don't think he can hang your hat on him to convert most of his chances but I think he would probably push us up from seventh to sixth if he was fit for the whole of the season and if I think about Borough's team fully fit midfield and defence and then shot goalkeeper in there as well that collective I think is good enough for sixth and call me delusional I'll fully accept it, but I think it's probably good enough to just be on a, a, in front of that that white line in sixth. But I don't know what you guys think. I'd, I'd agree with you because I, I, I think going back to, to your point about the league table, I think there's the top four and then there's everyone else from about fifth yeah. down to, I don't know, probably about 18th in this league and they can probably get into the playoffs. But um no, I, I just I, I feel like that top four is out of sight, but then there are inconsistencies in in other teams, which could lead to you know if we were a little bit more consistent, we could have easily came sixth. This isn't me kind of contradicting what I said on the last podcast, where I said the, there's been teams that have played better than us and and deserve the the last two playoff places because I still kind of stick by that. I think over the course of the season we haven't done enough. And if we somehow get into the playoffs, if, like I said earlier, if everyone else loses on Saturday, we win with three points off. And it's like, you know, do we do we start to get a little bit, not even excited, but, you know, actually talk about the possibility of the playoffs? If we were to get there, I'd first be wondering how we got there and then, um, you know, kind of worrying because I don't think with the amount of avail- uh, unavailability that we have that we're even equipped for the playoffs. Um, mm. You know, I think we'd, we'd play whoever's in third or fourth and and, and get knocked out. And I, I kind of feel like that may be the case for the teams that finish fifth and sixth as, as well. But I, it does come down to consistency. And I feel like that is something that we haven't been able to to get a lot of this season. And I think unavailability has had a massive amount to do with that. Yeah, I'd agree. I'd say the top top four have just been, well, in a different league. I've never seen a standard like it in the championship. So I would go as far as to say, you know, there's no reason why we haven't got a better squad or as good as the than West Brom or Norwich. I think it's just down to, as you say, unlucky with injuries and just as not being good enough at times and, and underperforming at home, I'd say. So, yeah, I think we'd have been in the mix, definitely. We've got a podcast question in here a little bit early, but a podcast question in <laughs> from Paul says, with Aileen top an our assist chart at the moment, does the number of injuries cover up the lack of creativity for this season? Uh, Dana, I'm going to come to you for this one. Yeah, well, the point on lack of creativity, that's not something I agree with because we're actually fifth for chances created in the league this season overall. That's up there with Leicester, Southampton, Leeds and Ipswich in that order as well. However, I did look into it and within our five lowest XG figures, four of them have come within the last five game weeks or Stoke, Plymouth, QPR and Southampton so maybe there's a case to be made for our attacking potential slightly dipping of late but for me the injuries don't cover it there you know they would go a way to explain it in my opinion like Isaiah Jones is a creative player Riley McGree last season was second in the Borough squad for expected assists we've got Finazars who you know he's created the ninth most 
big chances this season, albeit obviously a period of that was spent at Plymouth. And Dan Barlasa is creative. Some of the balls he was playing yesterday, really good. Uh, and don't forget, we had Morgan Rogers as well at a point this season. I know he's no longer here, but he was at one point. So Borough have been this season a creative side. I just think, and, and assists aren't really a good measure of creativity anyway, because you can play a five-yard ball to a somebody that smacks one in from 30 yards, top bins. Does that mean that assister is creative? It's just a simple square ball. So, yeah, I think Borough are a creative side. Slight dip of late, potentially, but I think the injuries have taken away creative players and it's really not a surprise then that maybe of late Borough have, have slightly declined in terms of our creative output. Someone you didn't mention in your list there who might have been a little bit creative was Matt Crooks, uh, scored a few goals this season mm-hmm. and we interviewed him like a month ago so if anyone hasn't listened to that yet, go back and listen to it because it was a great interview. But now we're going to talk about Sheffield Wednesday. Uh, Borough won 2-0 yesterday thanks to an own goal and are we calling it an Isaiah Jones goal? It, yeah. it was going in. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, whatever. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll give it to Jones. Yeah, they scored... Help helping Borough get the three points. Matt, how would you assess the game yesterday? I think first half it was not the same old. I thought we were better. In, we, we were better in possession, but we still lacked that little bit of quality. I think in the final third, we didn't really create or test the goalkeeper as much as I think we should have done. And I wouldn't say we we were performing as poorly as we have done at home, but it was kind of a similar sort of theme against a team near the bottom where we just weren't quite putting them to the sword. And the longer the game goes on, the more you worry that we were going to get that sort of sucker blow. But getting the first goal was was massive when we when we got it in the first half because absolutely 100% Sheffield Wednesday were poor. They were really, really poor. And it sounds like from their end of things, it was probably one of their worst performances under Danny Roll. He was especially frustrated after the game yesterday. But I think just seeing us get that first goal when we did forced them to to come out and, and the game opened up even more second half and I thought we, we improved quite a lot in the second half and it's the, I think it's the, the most I've seen us in terms of the most creative I've seen us at home for a long time in terms of the chances we were creating, we were carving them open quite easily, we had quite a few shots on goal. A strange caveat was that that's the first home when I've seen at the Riverside in the flesh since we beat Chelsea. Um, <laughs> and it was actually the first league win I've seen Borough have in person since we beat West Brom. So I was thoroughly, thoroughly happy with that. But um, yeah, it was good to just see us put that, put them to the sword. And we could have had, should have had another couple of penalties as well. So really on another day, if Borough had have, had have been 100% clinical and the referee hadn't have been a little bit of a idiot, um, we might have had three or four. That's if they'd have took the ball off Sam Greenwood and didn't let him take the penalties. But yeah, <laughs> it was um, it was a good performance. And it, I was just really, really happy just to see us play a side who we should be beating at home, drama-free, comfortable, clean sheet, happy days. I think you need to calm down with some of the ref abuse there, Master. <laughs> coming really coming from well. you. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> What was your thoughts on the referee's performance yesterday, Tom? (laughs) Yeah, please let us know. Come on, Tom. You don't want to know my thoughts on the referee yesterday. (laughs) (laughs) To be to be fair, I just thought he was bad, and I thought he was bad for both teams. Like there were Mm. some some decisions where I was left scratching my head, and it was even decisions that went for us. I was like, "What's he giving that for?" Um, Yeah, I I did think he can. There was there was actually a point that I uh, I pointed out to, to my dad when it happened. I can't remember who it was who got subbed off. I think it might have been Azaz, but the ref told him to go off at the at the nearest touchline, and he turned up, turned away, started walking towards the the tunnels and taking the long way across the pitch. And he was just kind of like, "Yeah, that's fine." I was like, he, he had no control over that game. Didn't a Sheffield um, Wednesday player do that as well, or am I thinking of I a think completely so. different game? Yeah, we we were all saying around us. Aren't they supposed to go off at the nearest, like take the nearest exit, mate? But he went the yeah. the whole way. I was like, okay, it's kind of inconsequential, I guess. But like, the rules are the rules, right? 
but yeah, whatever. Yeah, like, I- I think it was already 2-0 at that point and we were all just kind of like, it doesn't make a difference, but still like it does show that they're just ignoring the referee and, and doing yeah. what they want, but then he's done nothing about it. But anyway, uh, in terms of Borough and not the referee, Dana, would you say that is the most complete performance at home for a while? Um, it's a difficult question, this one, because I think we're etching into football cliches territory. Because for me, like the most complete performance, the barometer of that is like bright in a way under Karanka. Like that was pure, complete performance and away from home as well. Um, so I think relative to where Borough are right now, yes, maybe. I think it's the closest that we've we've kind of come to that, which is good, you know, because we've not had particularly great fortunes at home which is part of the reason why we've obviously struggled to get ourselves into that top six and really firm up a a promotion charge or a playoff charge so it's good to know that we can win at home and we can win at home against a team that I think many would have maybe thought we could potentially slip up against because our record against the teams around Sheffield Wednesday including Sheffield Wednesday have not been it's not been great this season so complete maybe the closest yeah but complete or not I think it was it was good to see Borough win at the Riverside I suppose in comparison to some of the performances that we've seen at home it probably (laughs) would have to be the most complete but yeah then there's it's a low bar and there's no real competition for us yeah exactly um yeah, D- Danny Roll said it should have been a lot more. Um, do you both think it could be a classic case of, of Borough's season of not finishing our chances created? Uh, apparently, we're we're second for biggest chances missed. Yeah, we we do love a missed chance, don't we? I mean, I looked at the stats after that game. Borough had twenty three shots, which may it may inflate how you kind of view the game if you look purely on stats if you're just an alien that's been plopped on and said yeah go on look at look at who scored and see what that game was like um 11 of them were outside the box though so out of the 12 in penalty area shots that we had there was one that I thought was a gill edge chance which was Jones's shot from Greenwood's cross I thought it was a lovely cross it was it was fizz across the face of goal but it bobbles up at probably the worst time for Jones as he goes to hit it. So I don't think that helps. I mean, would he have scored anyway? Probably not. It's Isaiah Jones. He's not exactly renowned for finishing his chances. But there was also a lot of last chance that I don't think he should have scored from, but I think he should have hit the target. Zaz releases him with the ball thrown through between the two centre halves. Um, and Lattie Lath, he takes a touch with like the instep of his right foot and it takes him wide instead of taking it towards the goalkeeper it kind of takes him away from it and it ends up with Sheffield Wednesday's defender for Maywo it gives him the chance to kind of come across narrow the angle and maybe to a degree put Latte Lath on and uh, off even and then he blazes it over the bar but I agree with you guys I'm going to weigh in on the on the referee here because we should have had two penalties on top of the the one that we already had there was a clear foul O'Brien gets absolutely wiped out. It's a really good, um, potentially a really good corner routine where he kind of peels around the back and it's connected by the pass from the corner and he gets absolutely wiped out by, I think it might have been um, a heck I think it was. And then Marvin Johnson blocks the ball with his hand from Zaya Jones' shot. And it's, it's like the most unnatural position you will ever see. He literally blocks it with his hand. How both of those were not penalties, I don't know. I mean, we don't really care in the end because it didn't cost, like, the referees' non-decisions didn't cost us the game. But, like, how did Matt Donoghue not see those? And then in the end, with the penalty that we did get, it took him about three working installments to actually see that Barry Bannon had very clearly handled the ball. So it's like, yeah, if you if you add that on to, I mean, there's no guarantee that whoever's going to take the penalty, be it Greenwood, be it Azaz, be it you 2 that you know, like I laugh, whoever, that it's going to be converted, but it gives us a bloody good opportunity to add goals to the scoreline. So, yeah, maybe maybe from that point of view, Danny Roll is, uh, maybe that's what he was thinking of. I don't know. But, yeah, should have had absolute two, Just two absolute stonewall penalties. On that point about the ref, because of where I was sat, um, I didn't see the handball for, for the penalty that was given. Uh, properly, he was facing away from me, and then 
Obviously, you mentioned the ref took three working days to uh, to give that decision. Apparently, no one appealed it other than the fans. And, yeah, that was and, weird. And he just kind of pointed it at the spot, and I was just like, <laughs> okay. But I thought that was... <laughs> At the time, I was like, he hasn't given a penalty for the other two, but he's given a penalty for that. I was like, I felt like that was harsh. And then I've watched it back since. I was like, yeah, okay, it was handball. But What's Bannon doing, it, by the way? Like, ah, no idea. He's waving to someone in the north, I think, isn't he? <laughs> I think you saw Rory. <laughs> the ref did take ages. I, I thought afterwards, has he like, has he thought, oh, I've, I've fumbled two decisions here. I need to... You know, I know this is a complete conspiracy of when you know do refs give decisions based off of previous ones they've they've missed. But I don't know. Did he look at the previous two that he's fumbled and thought, "Oh Christ!" You know, if if I have a chance to give them a penalty here, I will. Because Bannon like high fived the ball pretty much out the box. The referee <laughs> yeah. stood around, looked a bit, looked around for a bit, then pointed to the spot. It was it was really <laughs> weird, wasn't it? But on, on, we missed honestly, anyway. Yeah. If Bannon had some red paint on his hands, that ball would look like Wilson from Castaway after uh, after that penalty was given. <laughs> Full on volleyball, didn't he? Aye, but on on the uh, on the penalty, a uh, bit of a talking point. Latterlaff wanted to take take it. Greenwood told him, "No, I've got the ball. It's my ball. I'm taking it home and taking the penalty myself." Do you both think Latterlaff should have taken the penalty instead of Greenwood? I suppose it's easy at the same hindsight that you know he should have, but I think for me personally, watching that take place, I was like, you're taking the ball off the striker. He has taken penalties for us earlier this season and scored them. I, I don't think you should be doing that, but I'm interested to hear your guys' thoughts on it. I'd like to think there is a pre-assigned penalty taker in the dressing room before the game so this this issue is just not even a thing because it just makes Sam Green would look like a bit of a wally doesn't it I mean it happened in the Leeds game as well um I think Somerville took the ball for them Piro was literally trying to wrestle it from him and it would have looked really really bad on him had he missed and you just don't want to see players squabbling over a football so for me I'm not too bothered who takes it as long as whoever is the assigned penalty taker is given the ball and then if they score they score if they miss they miss um but Lath was the only one who appeared to want the ball, uh, so that makes me think he was the pre-assigned penalty taker and Greenwood just wasn't having any of it, so maybe it was karma for Lath that he went and hit the post, I don't know, but it's just it's just not something you like. I just don't like seeing that. I don't know why, I just don't like seeing players fighting over the ball. I feel like there should just be a decision made there and, and they just get on with it. Yeah, I'd agree. I'd, I'd want them all on the same page really, and I've, I'm also of the opinion that it should be pre-assigned. Dana, what's your opinion on it? I was just sort of silent there, because my opinion, honestly, is that I don't care. <laughs> like, we don't know who Borough's assigned penalty taker is. We could kind of maybe take a guess that it's Lati Lath purely just based on the fact that he's the striker, but... Like it's kind of like whatever. We won the game in the end. If it was one one nil nil or I don't know nil nil, and then Sheffield Wednesday go and score after this, then it would be far bigger a talking point than I feel like it should be. I just think it's a bit of a storm in a teacup. I know that we don't really want to see, and I laughed at Matt saying squabble over a football because that's quite funny. But like, yeah, you ideally don't want to see it. But like, I, I look back at it on my scout, and Greenwood does look over to the the touchline, so I don't know if he gets like a an approving nod from Carrick or or whatever. Like, we just don't know. So, my opinion, honestly, is that I don't care. He missed it. Pe like penalty takers miss. Grant missed a few, didn't he? But he scored more than he missed. It's just it, it can happen. So I'm not that bothered at the end of the day. Yeah, I, I, I think it's uh, not that big of an issue after we've we've won two nil very impressively as well. So speaking of impressively, we're now going to go to the present place. Ah, uh, yes, the present place where we can give praise to anything, and I'm going to have to think on the spot of what we can give praise to. Man and Dana's borough shirts, 
Matt's Borough shirt hanging up in the background there because he didn't get the secret memo that we were wearing Borough shirts for this one. <laughs> Could be anything. <laughs> you didn't get in the a... Borough breakdown memo, actually. Right, that, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's a good Shocking one. from us. You know, that's yeah, it, it, it really is not representing the not representing the brand. Dana, I'm going to come to you first. Who is your in your prison place for Borough over the Easter weekend? Well, I've got to put Matt Clark in there for that absolute defensive masterclass in a in a moment against Southampton. I also want to mention Senny Dieng in that game because I think he made some big saves that were were pretty important. I think he actually had a pretty mixed game overall. He did spill a couple, did parry a few in danger, but ultimately he made some big saves I also want to mention Dan Barlasa and I have to do this because he is the whipping boy the boo boy and I think that a lot of Borough fans not yeah maybe not a lot of Borough fans but too many Borough fans in my opinion have kind of made their mind up about Dan Barlasa now I'm not going to sit here and say that he's been good when he's not been because I think he has struggled particularly when teams press him and we've discussed this before but I thought he was really good against Sheffield Wednesday and I think because of the amount of stick that he's been getting, I did think during the game, he's been good here. But should I be thinking that? Because he's shy, isn't he? But actually, no, he's, he's a good player and he played well against Sheffield Wednesday. So he deserves his credit. So I'm going to give him it um, in the praise of place. So, yeah, I want to really spotlight Dan Barlasa this week because I think he, yeah, he deserves it for that performance. I completely agree that he deserves it. Matt, who's in your praise and place this week? I will agree with Barlasser as well. I thought he was fantastic, as was O'Brien yesterday. I think he, he covered every blade of, blade of grass. He was absolutely everywhere. Um, one of his best performances as well. I would give some praise to Matt Clark. I think we've mentioned already how good he's been. Um, Senny Dieng lives in my prison, uh, prison place. He has permanent residence there, so that goes without saying. Um, I think Lath as well. Uh, I would like to have seen him got on the score sheet against Sheffield Wednesday, but I thought, you know, his performance and, and the goal he got against Southampton was good. But I, I do want to mention Mr. Reliable, Johnny Housen, because I just, when I was watching the game yesterday and I was seeing how we were defending and I just thought he is, he's a 36-year-old central midfielder. He's playing in centre-back. It doesn't matter if it's a back three or back two. He just looks at home wherever he plays. He can play absolutely anywhere. And most of the time, he'll drop a 7 out of 10, 8 out of 10. And I just think, I just really want to just recognise how good Johnny Housen is while he's here. And I hope he still continues to be here because just his ability to slot into any part of the team at his age and still perform at such a brilliantly consistent standard is just amazing. So he deserves credit as well. He doesn't show any signs of aging. He's just mm. as, as young as he ever was. I think for my praise and place this week, I want to give praise to someone who's not been mentioned here, um, but I think does deserve a little bit, and it's Finn as us. Um, I thought yesterday uh, in the game against Chef Wed, he was showing a lot more glimpses of what I thought we were signing from, from Plymouth. Um, obviously, players take you know however long it takes them to bed in he's had some all right games some good games and some some not so good games he's not been that consistent since he came in but i don't really hold that against him because i think he can see the the potential that's there yesterday it looked he looked a lot more like the player who played against us for plymouth and if we can get that from him a lot more and have him you know a lot more consistent i think he's going to be one i really enjoy watching uh in this team and i don't want to necessarily give this player like praise in place type status but i feel like i have to mention it because of the amount i slated him before for one of his performances <laughs> but luke thomas wasn't that bad yesterday i've got to give him a little <laughs> bit of credit I'd, you know <laughs> I, I, I thought he did okay, and that is saying a lot considering he looked like Bambi on ice last time he was playing and couldn't stay yep. on his feet. So, yeah, it, it was a low bar, but he has cleared it, and hopefully now if he does get more chances, he can continue to clear that bar. I just want to mention someone a bit like Thomas who's kind of come under criticism, and I know we've spoken, we, we spoke about him there in regards to the penalty incident, but Sam Greenwood I thought was good in that second half in particular yesterday. So credit where credit's due. I think 
he has largely been ineffective at Borough in terms of his general performances, but I did think that yesterday it was better. And that's all we want to see from players, isn't it? We just want to see them build, we want to see them progress, and we want to see them improve. And in the case of Greenwood, in the case of Thomas, I guess, in, in the case of Barlasa and Finazaz, who I think has been building as well, there's four players there that have improved. So, yeah, praise the place mentions for those guys. Yeah, I think it should be noted with those players that as Borough fans, we should always want our players to to do well. And I, I know there was a lot of talk on, on BBC Tees yesterday about the kind of like agenda against Barlasa that a lot of fans have made their mind up. And it's like, you should be able to admit when a player has had a good game and give if you're going to slate them, you're going to give them credit when they have a good game. And I, I feel like, uh, you know, Barlasa, Greenwood... Thomas, to an extent, they all, you know, had all right games yesterday. So, like in Barlas's case, better than all right. So it needs to be noted. But now that I shocked everyone with that Luke Thomas uh, mentioning the praise and place, <laughs> let's move on to podcast questions. Gonna dive straight into this one. And this is a question for you both. And it is sent in by Freddie. He said, do we buy Greenwood for the room at 1.5 million or let him go? He played well yesterday, but he hasn't been the greatest for about 10 games before that. Matt, I'll come to you first. No, I don't think we sign Sam Greenwood. I will agree. I think he was much more effective yesterday than what he has been, but that was the first notable performance from him in what I feel has been a very, very long time. I think he he come in the side, he started really well. I remember the goal against Sunderland, the freak against Leicester. Obviously, he's gave us some pretty big moments and highlights, I would say. But I think consistently across the board, I don't think he's warranted a place in Borussia side next season. I think we can buy equally just as good, if not better, for 1.5 million. And his wages have to come into conversation because I believe if Leeds get promoted, he might be on a wage increase if his wages aren't already too high. So. Yeah, uh, I don't think he, he warrants for both his on-pitch performances across the season and for what his wages are reported to be if Leeds go up next season, which they maybe probably will. Yeah, I kind of agree with that, Dana. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. I mean, didn't Kieran Scott say that, yeah, there's a, there's a wage increase? I think that Leeds will go up. Obviously, it seems like it's likely. So I don't think that it's... It, I, I can't see it happening firstly, and I also don't think that it would necessarily be, I don't want to say smart business, but I can't think of anything else, so I'm just going to say smart business. I know he's a young player, but for 1.5 million, I, th- I do agree with Matt. I do feel as though we could potentially get better. Yeah, I think we're all in agreement on that one. Dana, I'm going to come to you for the next question. It's from Gokul. He says, reasons behind the complete upturn in form and clean sheets. Um, I, I guess it's kind of difficult to land on an answer because, I mean, I hate to be that person, but I do think we have to acknowledge the teams that we have faced in this run. With Norwich and Southampton aside... I will I will mention them though because I'm just about to read out the the list of teams. So Norwich, QPR, Birmingham, Blackburn, Southampton, and Sheffield Wednesday. In the case of Sheffield Wednesday and Birmingham, absolutely terrible. I couldn't watch the QPR game because my laptop was broke. So you guys might have to help me out with that one. But Blackburn, I mean Norwich. We'll start with Norwich actually with this because Borough they switched to the back three in that match, and it did not work at the beginning prior to Marcus Force's injury because Borough's performance was really poor in that opening, what was it, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, or whatever it was before signs got sent off. And that sending off was never in a million years a red card. So that was a massive, almost a sliding doors moment, really. But that moment in that game positively impacted Borough's performance because Norwich, their performance after that, their reaction to that red card was really poor. But I think it just allowed Borough to use that man advantage to their favour. And then obviously we ended up winning that game. And then against Southampton, you cannot get away from what we mentioned, the amount of chances 
that Southampton spurned. Now, I do think Borough were good value in the end for a point, but like it should have been massively out of sight. So I think Borough have been on the receiving end of good fortune, but alongside that, I can't not mention Marcus Force's injury against Blackburn because that did change the, the kind of tide away from Borough in that game and negatively impacted our performance. So it's difficult to kind of say, I guess my overarching view of it is that we have played some pretty decent teams in regards to their placement and that maybe this was kind of expected in the same way that I think we're coming up against Ipswich and Leeds soon in the same way that I think that I'm not expecting us to get anything from those games maybe this whole record of Borough performing poorly against the lower sides in this division has kind of reverted back to its expectancy and we're kind of seeing nature heal in a way. So, yeah, I guess we'll kind of see where Borough go from here. But I don't think it's I don't think it's a complete upturn yet, if that makes sense. Obviously, we've ch changed our form around, but I'm not going that strong on it. I just want to see us against better opposition consistently, starting with... Mid-table Swansea, which could be tricky for us because it would be very typical of Borough to not win that game. I think. Yeah, I mean, it'd be it would have been typical of Borough to not beat Sheffield Wednesday and true. You know, pick pick something up against Southampton. We've managed to clear the typical of Borough for Easter weekend. Can we do it next weekend? <laughs> Last question is from Ted, and I'm going to come to you both for this one. Ted says, how many players realistically do we need to sign in the summer to push for playoffs next year? This could be push for playoffs or automatic promotion, if that's what we'd like to see next year. Dana, I'm going to come to you first on this one. I've gone for a striker, a left winger, a right back, a central midfielder and, a and an attacking midfielder. Looking at our depth, I'd obviously like to see a striker. We've needed one since the summer. I would like to see us sign a left winger because I think besides Riley McGree, I just don't think the quality is there with the depth. Right back, Anthony Dyke steals out of contract, can't see him being signed on. There's, I think, is Tommy Smith out of contract as well? I think there's maybe question marks. I think Tommy oh. Smith's got a year left. Right, okay. Maybe, um, well, I, I imagine that he would stay on then, but we still need an extra option at right back. I know Rav can play there, but he's probably viewed as a centre-half, I would assume. Central midfielder because we might lose Hackney, but also I'd quite like that central midfielder to be O'Brien, to be honest. And then an attacking midfielder because I know we've got Finazaz, I know that maybe Riley McGree can play in that number 10 position, but losing Rogers was quite big. And I think that we need added depth and added quality there as well. So, yeah, um, five positions there for me. How about you, Matt? Yeah, I was thinking exactly the same, to be honest. Uh, I, I sort of had right back, left wing, 10, striker, and a central midfielder. I think we might need a bit of an overhaul in there if Hackney leaves. For me, I just want to see us sign quality. I think we are not going to need the overhaul that we needed last season because we've not left ourselves over a line on loans, which has been a, a positive of the recruitment this season. So I think we've got a better platform to build on from this point going into next season. So I think we're in a position, hopefully financially as well as you know squad-wise, where we can actually sign more quality than quantity, if that makes sense. We're not having to, to sign 10, 12 players to replace four or five loans, as well as add to other positions. Hopefully we can just look at certain areas and say, right, we've got the quantity across most of the team. Now let's add the quality to certain areas and if we can if we can add four even four quality players to this starting 11 with the current crop of players we've already got I think that will put us in a fantastic position to challenge for at least the playoffs next season so as long as we sign quality I'd be happy with four or five players at least I am really looking forward but also a bit nervous for the summer <clears throat> I just I, I really want us to to do something and and kind of go for it. I get the the model that we've we've gone with this year, and I think that that we have had players come through the door who have developed and will be first teamers next season. But then I'm also thinking, can we get those little bits of quality that we need in terms of you know 
established championship players if we can or obviously there, there is the model that we're we're going to need to do on lower wages but if if we can bring quality players through the door and really have a go of it next season um just so it's entertaining to watch and we don't end up with what we've had this season uh, especially at home but before we get to the summer we've got six games left and going to be looking ahead to swansea now uh only slightly, though, we will be having an opposition preview show with Luke from Swanscast later in the week. Um, but Dana, you've got a little bit on on Swansea for for this episode. Yeah, they're a, they're, they're very mid table at the moment. Swansea, their last ten games, they've won four, drawn two, and lost four. I just had to really struggle to say that there because I was working out whether that was in fact ten games. But it was, so we're all good. Um, but yeah, the, the fans are quite frustrated at the style of play under Luke Williams. I looked at jackarmy.net, which is one of the Swansea forums, and Swansea fan Phil Sumbler says this. We can talk about a Matt Grimes free kick that crashed back off the crossbar or a Govea cross that came back off the post, but the reality is we were served up another performance where a large part of the game was played at walking pace, and more than a fair share of the game was spent with the back line, which stretches as far as our midfield, playing about with the ball in our own half, often standing on the ball to slow it down even more, just in case there was ever any danger of us reaching as high as second gear. I think this is also of interest to Borough fans because he ends up saying uh, further on in that piece that Nathan Wood remains a disaster waiting to happen in the back line. So I think they're a bit disillusioned at the moment. They're on the beach and they're probably looking towards next season. So a bit of a, a tricky game for them potentially just because their fans just seem to be a little bit checked out. It's going to be interesting. I mean, I remember Luke Williams playing for us under uh, God oh, Strachan. God's Look sake. at him now. For <laughs> <laughs> God's sake. Um, going to move on to project, uh, predictions for the game after my shit crack there. Um, then I'm going to start <laughs> with you first. Uh, I'm going to go with 2-0 Borough for this one. I can't see them scoring but that means they probably will because I've cursed us. But yeah, 2-0, keep the, the good run going, keep the clean sheets going and hopefully everyone around us falls. I'm praying for their downfall just because I think it'd be funny and also it would open up the potential for Canberra again to the playoffs. Mark two or three or four or whatever we're on. Mas? I'm going to snap on that. I was going to say 2-0 and... I'll, uh, I'll go Latte Laugh to get a brace as well. Why not? I think for my prediction, I'm going to go 4 0. I'm going to go a bit out there. Um, I'm in hospitality. that part for... of the season. <laughs> yeah, I'm in hospitality for this game. And I'm just thinking what would go best with all the, the free drink and free food. And it would be a 4 0 win. I think the last time I was in hospitality was against Reading last season. I think that was 5 0, wasn't it? So. Mm. Yeah, uh, let's hope that run continues. But that is it for today. Thanks very much for joining me, guys, and for all the listeners and viewers for tuning in. This has been the Borough Breakdown podcast, and that was all your matchday chatter in a pod. Up the Borough Breakdown.